Коллеги, добрый день. Начинаем пресс-конференцию. Председатель. Dear colleagues, good afternoon. We are now beginning the press conference by the Governor of the Bank of Russia, Elvira Nabiulovna, and the Deputy Governor, Alexei Zabotkin. Traditionally, we will now start with a statement following the session of the Board of Directors. Good afternoon. Today, the Bank of Russia has decided to keep the key rate at 7.5% per annum. Current price growth rates are moderate, and consumer demand is subdued. Nonetheless, there have been signs of rising pressure on prices recently. Among pro-inflationary factors, I would focus on elevated inflation expectations, staff shortages in certain sectors, supply-side constraints, the expansion of the budget deficit, and a worsening of the external trade conditions. We will take it into account as the impact of those factors when pursuing our monetary policy. I would like to remind you that our objective is to bring inflation back to the target in 2024. Our forecast for the next year remains in the range of 5 to 7 percent. I would now dwell on the reasons behind our today's decision. First of all, I would like to talk of inflation. In November and early December, prices were rising primarily because of one-off factors, namely the indexation of the housing and utility rates in the first place. However, the influence of factors pushing up steady inflation is becoming stronger. This trend will continue next year. What are these factors? Firstly, households and businesses' inflation expectations remain elevated. Currently, they are not causing a rise in consumer activity because households are cautious about large purchases and still prefer savings. But the situation might turn around. Secondly, as the deficit of manpower has increased, companies' labour costs are growing. This is especially evident in the industrial sector, transport, logistics and construction. If wages grow faster than labour productivity, this might entail an additional rise in prices through businesses' costs. Another factor pushing up costs is associated with companies' adjustment to the changing conditions. Companies continue to search for new suppliers, alternative logistics and settlement methods and address challenging issues of new equipment imports and repairs of the already installed production lines. To a greater or lesser extent, enterprises will pass their labour costs through into prices for end consumers. Finally, this is fiscal policy. The Ministry of Finance has raised its estimate of the budget deficit from 0.9 to 2% of the GDP for this year. We took this into account when making our today's decision and will adjust our forecast accordingly after our core meeting in February. Currently, I can give the following comment. Both monetary and fiscal policies impact aggregate demand. If the flow of money through the budget channel goes up, it might become necessary to contain the inflow through the credit channel in order to ensure price stability. Therefore, all else being equal, more expansionary fiscal policy involves a higher level of interest rates. I would briefly talk of annual inflation. It will continue to slow down in the next few months, as the months of this year that were the heaviest in terms of price growth rates will be gradually excluded from its calculation. When inflation is highly volatile, its annual rate is not very informative about the pressure on prices as it is overloaded with previous shocks. In spring, annual inflation might drop even below 4%, but this will hardly characterize price trends here and now or there and then. In such situations, when making our decisions, we are focusing more on our forecast and current indicators of steady pressure on prices adjusted for one-off factors. Secondly, I will now speak of the economic situation. The external trade restrictions continue to create challenges for companies this month. They were exacerbated by the embargo on oil exports that become effective and the introduction of the oil price cap. We will present the estimate of their effects in our updated forecast in February. Business activity was bouncing back in October after its decline in the previous month. Business surveys suggest that this upward trend continued in November as well. After dropping in October, the Bank of Russia's business climate index went up.
Companies' current estimates and expectations about output and demand have improved, especially in services. Speaking of investment activity, a slowdown in private investment is partially offset by an increase in government investment. As to regions, the expansion of investment has been most significant in the Far East. This region is actively constructing and upgrading its transport and logistics infrastructure to improve its throughput capacity. Imports through the eastern seaports have already exceeded last year's figures by a fourth. The bottlenecking is critical for the structural transformation of the economy. More details about investment activity in Russian regions is provided in the December report titled Regional Economy. Consumer activity is highly uneven across regions. Moscow and St. Petersburg have faced a slump in consumption, whereas the Urals, the Far East and the south of Russia record approximately the same level of consumer demand as during the previous year. Overall, we characterize demand as moderate. Households still prefer to save. Thirdly, monetary conditions remain neutral overall. After rising in September, yields on federal government bonds have changed only slightly. However, the slope of the curve has become a little steeper. That is, short-term yields have adjusted downwards, while long-term yields remain the same. This reflects the persistently higher geopolitical risks, elevated inflation expectations, and the expansion of the government borrowings. Overall, lending conditions have not been limiting credit activity. Growth rates in corporate and mortgage lending have been high. Disbursements of unsecured consumer loans have been rebounding. Deposit rates have continued to adjust to higher yields on federal government bonds that rose in September. This contributed to a slight inflow of funds into deposits. The de-dollarization of banks' balance sheets has continued in recent months. The structure of the demand for money is changing. Instead of foreign currency, ruble is used increasingly more extensively to make payments, raise investments and form savings. This has considerably boosted ruble money supply, the M2 aggregate, which has been widely noticed. Nevertheless, the broad money indicator, the M2 X aggregate, is more informative as it also covers deposits and accounts in foreign currency. This indicator is growing at a pace not exceeding annual inflation. I will now speak of the risks that might cause a deviation of inflation from the baseline forecast. Short-term risks have shifted towards pro-inflationary ones and their list has expanded. As before, we see the risks of a more considerable downturn in the world economy than assumed in our baseline scenario, although there are recent data about a slowdown of inflation in some advanced economies and, accordingly, lower risks of an excessive tightening of their monetary policies. As regards external conditions, the economy is affected by the sanctions. The introduction of the embargo and the price cap for Russian crude occurred simultaneously with a decline in global prices for hydrocarbons caused by a worsening of global economic prospects. A long period of low prices or their additional significant reduction might entail a steady loss of revenues for exporters, involve a faster contraction of the balance of trade, putting pressure on the ruble, which would mean also a faster decline in the trading balance. An important group of risks is associated with the situation in the labour market. Staff shortages are likely to become more acute further. Consequently, not only unemployment might drop to a record low next year, but also wages might grow significantly faster than labour productivity. Finally, a possible expansion of the budget deficit compared to the current plan might also become a pro-inflationary risk. The group of disinflationary risks is weaker. 
They include a situation where households' propensity to save remains at the current credit rates. Moreover, in a situation of higher uncertainty, banks might tighten their requirements for borrows and collaterals even more. All this might cool down lending and consequently contain I inflation. So, this cooling down of lending activity will be a consequence of uh, the above mentioned and deter upward trends. Winding up, I would like to comment on our future decisions. The economy continues to adapt to the current changes. We will analyze the information about the progress of companies' adjustment to the new environment, trends in consumers' behavior and inflation expectations, changes in the external conditions and the expansion of government demand. Considering all the incoming data, the Bank of Russia will determine the path of the key rate so as not to hinder the structural transformation of the economy and ensure the return of inflation to the target of close to 4% in 2024. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Now, dear colleagues, we're beginning the Q&A session. Don't hesitate to introduce yourselves and identify your agency, and I will help you sometimes. Nastya, please. Uh, good afternoon, Savi Oliva, Anastasia, Interfax Agency. Uh, could you possibly say the lack of a signal in your statement? Should it be continued to be interpreted that, uh, like previously, that the possible move of the rate upwards or downwards, to what extent, generally, because of a stronger proinflationary set of risks that you refer to, it is probable that the monetary policy is going to be toughened? I mean, that the central bank will switch uh, from the neutral to a uh, moderately tough monetary policy in the midterm. Outlook. And one more question. You mentioned that you will assess and will take into account the introduction of the embargo and the price cap for the Russian crude. But is it possible for you to assess right now whether this is a serious risk for the economic activity in Russia to decline? And can, the, can this situation be described as a shock? We issued a neutral signal, which means that our subsequent decision as to the rate trend will depend upon the incoming data and what kind of factors would prevail pro-inflationary, disinflation. But as I stress, the pro-inflationary factors, as we believe, are currently prevail not only within the mid-term uh, horizon, but also within the short-term outlook. So once again, the uh, rate move will depend upon the incoming trend in terms of possibly keeping it as is or changing it as long as the disinflationary factor may materialize that we currently believe is weak. In as far as the impact from the embargo is concerned, in the meantime, it is somewhat difficult to evaluate all of its uh, impacts. We will try and do this during our core February meeting. Once we update our forecast, we will have more information as well as about the reaction from the Russian side. We will take into account in February. Dear colleagues, please, the next question, Marsha. Uh, good afternoon. TAS Information Agency, Maria Stepanova, I have several questions. The first uh, media was uh, saying that the authorities are looking into the mechanism of uh, the installment payment for the acquisition of housing. Uh, what does the central bank think about this initiative and when it might come into effect if it is currently being worked on? Uh, similarly, the central bank on more than one occasion mentioned that it will reduce uh, the uh, influence from the toxic currency. It was also mentioned um, that there will be certain markups uh, on the uh, lending to uh, um, corporates um, uh, in currency. Uh, when this is going to start working and what are other measures that you are undertaking to reduce the toxic currency balances uh, for the Russian banks? Another question about the VTB or Kriti Bank and the central bank deal. At what stage is it now? Is it uh, clear yet? what will happen to the Otkritia Bank uh, management because, again, the media um, mentioned the news that the executives might leave the bank altogether. Thank you. As far as uh, possible mechanisms for 
making payment for housing by installments and uh, delayed throughout a certain period of time. We'll definitely be coming with this uh, information later on, but as far as reducing the share of the toxic currencies on the bank's balance sheets is concerned, indeed, there comes up a possibility for us to ins to start using differentiated markups depending upon the type of a currency in question. At this point in time, we do not see the need to apply this particular tool. We will be looking at what will be happening to the bank's balance sheets and their open FX positions, and most importantly, their balanced approach to currency because certain serious changes are currently taking place. and. Uh, so the mechanisms are going to be applied according to the need. In terms of the divestiture from the liquidity bank is concerned, it is currently going through the final stage, and we intend to close the deal before the end of this year. That is what we are confirming. Yes, Dmitry, please. Dmitry Butenka, Commerçant. You noted in your presentation four groups of risks could you, I mean, clearly you cannot assess them from the point of view of probability of how they may unfold, but in terms of potential weight within the six months um, horizon, could you rank them? Well, we both assess them based on their probability and weight because a lot depends upon the way they're mixed, but we all uh, we believe that all there require attention. Uh, I, I think that you are talking more about the pro-inflationary risks and definitely the inflationary expectations which remain elevated despite the fact that already throughout several months the current inflation has been subdued, and usually the inflation expectations, they follow in the wake of the actual inflation, but here we see that they remain elevated, and this is the factor which concerns us. Are there factors that I also listed with respect to the fiscal system and the external um, restrictions and the labor market that we are looking into very attentively right now? They are out there, and uh, there is a certain aggregated effect that they generate that is always the subject of the discussion at the board of directors meeting, as well as uh, the subject of the collective debate around these risks. Margarita Mordovina, RBK. I will have several questions. The first one is related to the Ministry of Finance a proposal to unify the federal bond payment issues so that um, um, the foreign holders could also be entitled to it rather than what it is right now. Does the central bank support this idea? What stage it is currently being at? Another question is about the reporting. Your colleague, Sergei Shvetsov, recently mentioned that the companies either need to disclose their reporting or come up with an adequate explanation as to why they're not disclosing their uh, financials. At the same time, the control an oversight over such uh, uh, disclosures, so yes, suggested they should be vested with the central bank. So what central bank's attitude towards this initiative? Is it ready to uh, take on this oversight function and whether one should really uh, force somebody to disclose in such a, a directive manner? And the last question is about the fund from which it is expected to pay compensation to investors at which phase, at which stage this particular initiative is currently at. Thank you. With regard to the proposal, as you are saying, to unify the um, coupon payment related to the federal bonds, we believe that this particular issue should be looked at tightly linked to the need to satisfy the interests of the Russian entities whose assets have been blocked because of the introduction of sanctions. But at the same time, I would like to underscore that the foreign entities and the Russian jurisdictions have not been restricted um, in terms of the C accounts. That could have been the case, but in terms of the S type of accounts, it is possible to reinvest uh, the proceeds to pay for taxes uh, and other fees. So all of these issues should be considered as a whole. As far as the reporting disclosure is concerned, let me remind you that the government decree that entitles the issuers not to disclose either p 
part of the information or full information is in place until July 1st. The central bank's position is that post July 1st, one must disclose information and the order of things should be followed that is currently in place because the current order of things doesn't call for any explanations to be given. But after July 1st, we believe that the procedure should be followed when there are certain restrictions pertaining to the information disclosure, so the issues should notify the central bank if they are not to disclose, and the central banks then would verify the extent to which it conforms to the established rules uh, whereby the information can be partially withheld. So we're looking at the possibility of broadening such restrictions considering the sensitivity of data but overall our position is such that one should switch to a fuller disclosure yes the exceptions might apply to sensitive information the list of such information shouldn't be long because the ability to assess information is principally important for investors and we count on the capital market to develop further and for investors to be able to invest into securities one should go back to a normal uh, disclosure procedure with some several exceptions uh, but uh, in terms of the exceptions that uh, there are there um, that is something that the central bank should be able to audit uh, as uh, the process is uh, having it now in as far as the partial compensation to investors uh, for not uh, being able to receive uh, uh, income uh, through the Deposit Insurance Corporation, we haven't yet reached the substantial progress in this issue. The next question comes from St. Petersburg, Artemy Smirnov, the e Evening St. Petersburg newspaper. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, a slightly boring question, but quite a curious one. Look, according to the published date in the beginning of November, the central bank gave um, as a loan to the commercial banks 1.4 trillion. Uh, they uh, invested this money primarily into the Minister of Finance uh, the issued bonds. And thanks to that, the Minister of Finance was able to raise the record amount of money, about 1.1 trillion by the end of the month, and later on, 873 billion within one day. At the end of uh, December, at uh, the beginning of December, uh, it uh, repeated itself. Uh, the loan came up with 1.7, and then the Minister of Finance raised 852 billion. So we, I think, may anticipate that uh, this is the way the budget deficit is being financed. And so I have uh, two questions. Can we describe it as the Russian option for the quantitative easing? And the second question what kind of the level of easing the ruble exchange? change rate that the central bank believes to be uh, uh, feasible. Indeed, the Ministry of Finance grew its federal bond issues over the past several months, and at the same time, uh, the um, core spending from the fiscal system traditionally have been carried forward to the end of the year, and the kind of uh, repo transactions that we are conducting enable one to support the bank's liquidity before respective amounts of money in terms of the government spending will reach them, which reduces the rate volatility in the money market. And this is not a unique situation. We did it back in 2020, or was it 2021? I think it was in 2020 when the Ministry of Finance towards the end of the year was borrowing um, sufficiently, and the banks were using our report. Um, <laughs> possibilities which they repaid fully towards the end of the year when the government money reached their account because report transactions is a reversing kind of a transaction. In November, uh, 1.4 trillion was raised indeed for 30 days. The banks returned this uh, money in December and in December they borrowed 1 trillion. Yeah a small amount of money in. So we expect that uh, this amount of debt they will reduce in January after the December spending uh, comes down their way and uh, the demand at the tendering session in January is going to be lower. Now the report transactions are different from the so-called quantitative easing programs both in terms of uh, their target and substance as part of the quantitative easing programs. Central banks buy 
by paper and the structure of the central bank balance sheets changes, if not uh, irreversibly, then for a continuous period of time until they start selling the securities while running the repo transactions, which are reversible, can be terminated at any point in time. And so the quantitative easing programs were being applied by other countries as well when they could no longer reduce the rates, and that was done for the purpose of increasing inflation. I mean, not just to finance the fiscal deficit, but specifically from the point of view of impacting inflation when the rates were very low, close to zero. The repo transactions that are being done by the Central Bank of Russia doesn't lead to any shifts in its uh, monetary policies, and consequently there is no e impact upon the FX rate. Thank you, Delia. In the last row, please. Thank you. I also have two questions, Lvita Saibzanovna. My first question today in your statement about the rate you said that the economic activity in Q4 somewhat improved. Uh, consequently, my question is this. What is your uh, expectation as to the GDP decline this year? Will it be somewhere around two and a half? Or does the central bank uh, consider here a more pessimistic outcome? And what will happen to the next year? Will be able to fit into 1% range. Uh, second question, you also said that in spring the annual inflation may uh, decline below 4%. Does it mean that the central bank allows for the inflation target uh, reached uh, in 2023 rather than in 2024? As far as our GDP expectations for this year are concerned. You may recall our last forecast, which we issued in October, which was 3.5%. Three, Based on our expectations, the GDP growth will be close to the upper thresholds, uh, more probably close to 3%. But of course, a lot depends upon the economic dynamics through November and December. If it's a good one, the GDP may fall below 3% this year. Now, for next year, we will further update our forecast in February, bearing in mind all the factors which have taken place, which are going to happen. We will take them all into account and we will come back with an updated forecast in February. As far as the reduction of the annual inflation below 4% mark next year, probably in spring, this doesn't mean overall that we will fall below the target. Our forecast for the full year is 5 to 7 percent. The annual inflation will decline because of the base effect. To us, though, an important thing is the stable inflation components, which for quite some time stayed below our target of 4 percent. But currently, we see that the price pressure may increase and proinflationary risk may follow suit. And so we would specifically bear this in mind, because once again, our target is to bring the inflation back to 4% in 2024. But for that purpose, we will pay more attention to the stable inflation factors. The next question comes online. Evgenia Bismillah from Bloomberg. Please, Shenya. Good afternoon. Over the past few years, the Ministry of Finance have been taking on a record amount of uh, commitments in terms of the payments linked to the um, key rate, not only the floating coupon uh, sovereign bond, but also the mortgage lending. Uh, the economists counted about 15 trillion rubles altogether. In this way, the raising of the key rate by one percentage point a year may cost to the fiscal system about 150 billion rubles. Are there any risks that such a sensitivity of the government spending around the key rate may restrict your ability to raise it? Maybe the Minister of Finance currently is uh, deeper involved in defining the key rate. That is my first question. And my second question, 
Following on what my previous colleague said, you said that soon the Treaty and VTB deal is going to be closed, where you will change uh, the issued bonds from VTB to Treaty. Uh, and could you simply explain why the central bank had to do this? What was the strategy? Because you've been investing into Treaty for so long in order to liquidate it uh, in exchange for a mythical support from a suffering government bank. Well, as far as our decision on the key rate is concerned, this is in no way being impacted by the share of spending in the transactions subsidized by the Minister of Finance or anything else. We make a decision on the key rate based on our analysis of the environment and our forecast and our key task here is to return inflation and maintain inflation close to 4% level. As far as the Central Bank's sale of what Crete is concerned, on more than one occasion I was explaining in the very beginning when we had to start the procedures around Otkritia and act as an interim owner, we treated it as a temporary thing and that we would have to divest from the bank as soon as possible. We act as a regulator and a supervisory authority, and so having our bank as our property was abnormal. And so as soon as we were able to improve the situation in the bank, we immediately started preparing to sell it, and we started pushing it forward, uh, but because of the changing situation, that practically became impossible. But we believe that this bank must be sold, and so we believe that this deal will specifically be able to promote the development of the banking sector without the involvement of the central bank in the status of a proprietor. Good afternoon. The central bank uh, came out with a letter where it noted to the brokers uh, to assist uh, the clients to submit individual applications to get unblocked with a list of documents attached which are necessary in order for such an application to be processed. And so what we were facing was that some of the brokers are not ready to provide such documents because of different reasons. For example, a, an agreement with the high instance depository agency. So what are the investors here can do, particularly the ones who, because of different reasons, were not able to make it into these joint collective unblockings that brokers do? My next question is how investors may verify the fact that he is mentioned in a collective application. For example, one of the brokers who I asked suggested that I should forward to him my letter through the Russian postal system in order to receive a confirmation that I am that I'm in the list. So if I'm sending this letter today and in two weeks' time I'm finding out that I'm not there, there won't be any time left for me to get into any list. And so what do we believe? What kind of investors should be submitting an application for individual unblocking, and possibly what kind of categories investors don't have to do that, and what's your general uh, impression from this collective application that brokers are currently trying to do? All right, let me start with the last questions, I suppose. The decision to submit an application to unblock the frozen asset, of course, is something that individual investors should do at his discretion. We indeed came out with our recommendations to the financial institutions so that they could help their clients to provide the necessary documents and information as long as investors decided to submit such a request and uh, decided to uh, contact administrative and other government authorities and institutions in other jurisdictions. And I can tell you that there is no guarantee that such an unblocking may happen. We won't even take upon ourselves to assess the probability of it happening because that is at the discretion of different jurisdictions. But nevertheless, we ask the financial institutions to help and aid their customers. You are saying that there are uh, rejections are happening, and we would like to receive more information about it because I believe that the financial institutions in such situations ought to assist their clients. But apart from it, we also ask financial institutions to notify their clients about possible expenses that they might have to incur 
while submitting individual queries because that might involve some substantial costs when submitting uh, court suits when they would be disputing uh, possible uh, decisions in the administrative or judicial institutions. In some cases, this cost may exceed the value of the frozen assets, and so such ability to notify customers about potential spending is necessary in order for them to make well-informed decisions. You also mentioned that information is needed about um, um, whether investors are present in the uh, class case lawsuit. If financial institutions are not making such information available, thank you for noting it. We will look into how this problem can be uh, solved because I'm sure that investors must receive information whether they're part of a class act or not in order to be able to stand up to their rights. Thank you. The next question comes from Yekaterinburg, Alexei Chernomirin, the Ural Business Consulting. Should one underestimate the so-called salad inflation or the price is growing for uh, fruits and vegetables? Because in February, the inflation for that particular category was from 0.1 uh, to 11 percent throughout the annual period. The whole of the vegetables and uh, uh, greens nominally have um, lost their prices by 4.08 percent. So what is the regulator's forecast for this particular segment dynamics towards the end of 2022? Well, indeed, the prices for greens and vegetables are always susceptible to high volatility. You know, whenever we are talking about possible risks and one-off factors, whenever we mention the potential uh, price dynamics for uh, vegetables uh, and uh, greens, that is very much depend upon the season. The highest prices we know in the beginning of spring and, and the lowest prices uh, towards the uh, fall. Usually uh, during the summer, uh, prices uh, fall by one quarter. Uh, very volatile they are. But one should say that principally the higher is the inflation, the higher is the overall price growth rate, the broader could be the price uh, range in between different reason, regions. We've uh, been able to see it during the spring peak inflation. Currently, this range narrows down, but generally, uh, this uh, diversity of prices in between different regions will sustain, and that will be dependent not only upon the general inflation level, the high inflation once again, the broader is the range, uh, the lower the inflation, the narrower is the range, but also there are structural factors, like, for example, the existence of a well developed farming industry locally and the good purchasing capacity, the level of competition in the local food markets, all of it put together impact the price dynamics for um, vegetable products and greens. Um, before every board of directors meeting, uh, we uh, hear uh, the uh, reports coming from our regional offices about what is happening at the regional level. Uh, definitely, we make our decisions based upon the forecast and the inflation dynamics uh, related to other indicators throughout the country. But in terms of a strong attention to such price dynamics per all uh, products, including the uh, uh, vegetables and greens, enable us to identify the trends and uh, take a more precise look at how the forecast should trend overall. So we're definitely taking this data into account when uh, coming up with uh, the central bank's board of directors' opinion towards the current and future situations. But we make our decisions still based upon the indicators and the dynamics across the country. Gulnar Vahita from the Russian Gazette. I have two questions. The first is about your today's statement that new sanctions uh, towards the Russian crude, as well as the coinciding with the decline of the global oil prices, may create the additional pressure upon the ruble. How strong uh, this pressure may turn out to be, considering the current environment. And my second question is about the de-dollarization of the economy. 
The current level of currency deposits uh, went below 10 percent. Its maximum level of 2015, it was about 30 percent. Is there any comfortable level for the central bank as to the level of currency deposits by households? I would ask um, uh, uh, Alexei Borisovich to answer the first and maybe the second question as well. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, indeed. Um, following the dynamics, we can see that its actual trend of the uh, currency exchange rate we see follows what's happening to the global crude prices as well as the Russian crude exports. It does impact uh, the exchange rate. It has shifted. And uh, in the meantime, it is staying within the range within which it has been floating around since the beginning of summer, but at the upper threshold. And with all things being equal, uh, a meaningful worsening of the trading terms means a weaker uh, FX rate uh, and following the tradition that uh, the Bank of Russia never announces any uh, exchange rate uh, forecast, it is somewhat difficult for me to sound uh, uh, specific. But as Elvira Sahibzadovna has noted, as to the risks about our base forecast, we are reviewing the risks uh, on the side of the external conditions as pro-inflationary pro for 2023. As far as the so-called comfortable level of the household's currency deposits in the bank, we don't have such uh, valuations, although there are various surveys on the subject when the uh, currency component of the household's deposit may bear certain risks to the financial stability whenever they are above a certain level, because we know that in some jurisdictions, under some situations, we also had an elevated uh, level of currency uh, deposits, about 40, about 60 percent at different times. And so uh, some experts believe that whenever, whenever it is below 15 percent, that would mean a normal level. We don't come up with such assessments. Now, as to the to a certain level of households deposit like that, it will always be out there. We do note that the household deposit have been de-dollarized. De we note um, other currencies uh, coming into the fourth stage, like RMBs, and so people decide uh, for themselves which kind of currencies they should be better off with. Tatiana Vorona from Frank Media. Next question. Good afternoon. I have three questions, if I may. The first one is also related to deposits, but not the ones that are being kept in hard currency in Russia, rather the ones that the Russians have put outside of Russia. Following your statistics, we see that this level has reached 66 billion U.S., which is almost 4 trillion rubles. Now, the question, doesn't it concern the central bank? And if I may put it forward in a cautious way, is there any idea that uh, is currently being considered in order to bring these deposits back to Russia and uh, should one? bring them back to Russia. My next question is about uh, the mortgage from the construction development, or rather from the Minister of Construction. The Minister of Construction suggested that the level of rates under such programs should be at 4 percent. So generally, what do you think about uh, the extension of the subsidized mortgage program? And my last question, currently the, there are negotiations underway about returning part of the crisis subordinated loan that the spare bank uh, received in since 2008 back to the fiscal system. Does the central bank plan this for this money to come back into the government system? As far as the outflow of uh, current cash outside of Russia is concerned, no, we're not concerned by it. We don't believe it is necessary to undertake any special measures because of it. But uh, returning this uh, funds back into the Russian banking system, into rubles, will start as the confidence in the macroeconomic stability and the price stability grow. So our task is to ensure price stability and bring back the inflation to the 4% uh, target. In this case, the people will have less concerns about their ruble savings being eaten by inflation. 
And I believe that this is something that we should be working to achieve based on the economic stimulus and the normal market motivation. As far as the mortgage offered by the construction developers is concerned, we believe that such arrangements should be reduced and closed off. We see that all such schemes are related uh, to uh, the uh, house housing prices being exaggerated. And when we see that the people are confronted by the uh, having to confront the uh, exaggerated uh, household market prices, uh, meaning that they will have to pay more f compared to the lending that they have been mortgaged, uh, because there may even be cases when having paid in full, they will remain in debt to the bank when they uh, sell their um, acquisition in the secondary market. So we will be changing the system around with the help of the banking regulation. And as far as the subsidized mortgaging is concerned, the decision about it has been made. The subsidized mortgage um, possibility is called upon to help the developers and the economy. The important thing to us is where we are going to watch over the quality of this program. We have the instruments in our hands in order to uh, not allow for the high-risk mortgage uh, to grow because there are micro prudential measures in place and there are other measures for us to restrict uh, the uh, uh, developer proposed mortgage arrangements and other mechanisms, and we will insist, and we have already called upon the government in order for the subsidized mortgage program not to include such other uh, schemes and arrangements. Thanks very much. Anna Svistima from Russia 24. Anna Lazaria, Russia 24. Good afternoon. I have a question about the European Union, which continues to discuss the possibility of using the frozen Russian assets to assist Ukraine, based on your estimate, how realistic it is and what the central bank is undertaking in order to return these assets. We are not in a position to comment upon how difficult and uh, hard it is and what is the probability we follow these discussions regarding the frozen Russian assets, but in as far as any work may be done to return these assets, we are looking into the legal line of approaching it, but that is not an easy thing. Ina Aldoshna, please. Ina Aldoshna, Frank Media. I will have two questions. The first one, have the uh, government commission discussed or whether the Intesa bank shareholders been given the permission to sell their bank in Russia, or is the government commission currently discussing similar kind of decision uh, regarding the banks who have their subsidiaries in Russia? My second question, why the central bank is against experimental projects for dealing with the cryptocurrency in Russia. What kind of legal aspects are a subject of your concern? As far as issuing permits like that uh, are concerned, we're not commenting um, until the decision is finalized. As far as the acquisition of the shares in the banks are concerned, I can only confirm that there are such requests, and the governmental commission is considering them. As far as the experimental legal regime, for cryptocurrencies. So we believe that as part of the experimental legal regime through an authorized institution, it will be possible to consider the possibility of such transactions within the Russian jurisdiction, but the respective legislation must be passed because our objection has always been that the cryptocurrency cannot be used as the settlement Asset. And it cannot be the means of investing into financial assets for a mass invest, because this is a very risky, very volatile asset. And so in terms of protecting the rights of investors, we believe it is not um, uh, uh, rational to allow mass investors to have access to this. I would also add the following. If one allows 
free circulation of cryptocurrency as an investment vehicle inside the country invariably when the ownership of such cryptocurrencies will grow it will start being used as the means of payment and it won't be possible to counter it so the only experimental legal regime is for in case uh, the legal side of it is resolved only for the purpose of using crypto assets to support foreign economic activity thank you the next question comes from Novosibirsk, Julia Danilova, InfoPro 54 portal. What is the probability of accessible investment credits uh, being offered to businesses who are working within the import substitution government projects? First of all, investment loans are already being made available to businesses which participate in the import substitution projects, clearly. Businesses raise the issue of um, expanding the range of opportunities to use such uh, investment loans. But let me remind you, such an investment loan usually covers the period of more than three years. So the uh, uh, such loans uh, in terms of more than three years in duration have grown by 4.5 percent. So the numbers are growing. And actually, their rate has uh, fallen. Back in March, it was about 11 percent, even about 12. It was 12 percent. So currently, it is about 9 percent. So that broadens the availability of such investment loans in order to make them more accessible. There are two basic factors. Uh, first of all, uh, price stability, low inflation, because whenever banks uh, offer loans for long term, they also put underneath their inflation forecast because money has to find its way back uh, considering such an inflation. The higher is the expected inflation, the higher is the rate uh, and for long-term loans. And so uh, the reduction of inflation against this uh, will bring down the um, infl investment uh, loan rates as well. We also um, take into account various amendments into the regulation uh, in terms of the risk so that the banks in corporate lending will shift their emphasis more towards funding transformation projects. And these are plain investment projects. And together with the government, we're preparing the taxonomy of such projects. And this is not the list, but the criteria in order to make the banks more willing to fund such projects. Thank you very much. The next question comes online. Tatiana Chubasa from Interfax, please. Good afternoon. I have three questions. The first one, can you uh, share your assessment of the financial results of the banking industry in 2022? Um, uh, is it a loss-making industry or not? And your assessment for 2023, what will happen to the banking industry? Will it be able to demonstrate uh, profits towards the end of 2023? My second question about the banking sector support uh, fund. Uh, this is something that the Central Bank uh, is currently discussing. Could you please comment? And what for uh, the central bank uh, is pursuing such an idea? Because there are several support mechanisms in place. So, what is it needed for? And what do banks think about think about it? Because that will incur additional costs for them. My next question is related. To Tatiana, sorry, what kind of support mechanism I missed out? Uh, the banking sector support mechanisms. Oh, I understand. So, what it is needed for, because that would incur additional uh, uh, spending by the banks. And the third question, uh, still on the equity and V2B transaction, because the market players have uh, questions about the ability for the bank to pay as a payer, because recently it uh, uh, stopped paying its coupons on uh, its subordinated uh, bonds. And so why should one expect the bank to be capable of paying when it refuses uh, paying to its coupon holders? So it looks a bit strange. Thank you very much. As far as the financial results are concerned for 2022, um, it is uh, <coughs> premature for me to give you specific estimates. I simply can tell you that the banking sector has reduced its uh, losses compared to what uh, we were able to see in the middle of summer. And many banks were able to return to um, the 
profits. So we expect that in 2023 the banking sector will be making profits. As far as the banking sector support fund is concerned, this is the topic which we started debating, and this is a long-term issue in its capacity as a practical mechanism and its potential implementation is something that we will revisit in several years' time because we believe it is important currently to discuss systemic kind of mechanisms whereby the banking system creates collective cushions or buffers to be able to face crises because the banks are currently establishing individual systems like that thanks to the markups that we instituted and such individual buffers were being very actively used and so these reserve capital that the banks were able to accumulate individually uh, helped it to absorb the individual loss making that was back in the last year and this year as well and so we feel that in case the scenarios unfold when the banks may face systemic risks. It is very important to be able to have a collective buffer. And this is the idea that we shall continue looking into, but uh, we believe that it is a very useful one. Instead of calling upon the fiscal system in case there is a need for a systemic additional capitalization, it is important, on the contrary, to create a systemic and collective buffer. This time, yes, the budget had to help. Individual buffers were effective. Various uh, regulatory easing in our part also helped, but to a larger extent, the greater stability of the banking sector facing possible systemic risks, it is important to have such collective buffers, and we shall continue uh, discussing it. And as far as the Vitabi or Tkritia deal is concerned, we have no doubt um, about the ability of the Vitabi to pay. Thanks very much, colleagues. So many questions, so I will try and allow those to raise their questions who haven't yet been given such an opportunity. Olga, please. Good afternoon. My question is about the private investors. The first one, individual investment accounts. Periodically, we see different uh, information that certain changes are going to be introduced into the way an individual investment account should be regulated. And this information has been coming out for about 18 months by now. And investors started saying, well, that uh, nobody should be paying attention because soon everything will change around again. And so henceforth, it's my question, all these changes, is it for 2023 or throughout 2023, people can continue using this system as they uh, have so far and only then raise questions. And my second question, what kind of an advice you can give to uh, Russian private investors who are investing into the Russian financial assets for 2023? All right, so let me begin uh, with the individual investors. Well, the mechanism of individual investment account was very much in demand and very attractive and we noted that many of the Russian citizens are investing through individual investment accounts. Yes, indeed. Um, there are plans in the making to reform uh, the system of individual investment accounts and we have been working together with the Minister of Finance. Our position uh, here has already been cleared through and further on it will depend upon how the subsequent discussion may um, emerge and what kind of the decision the legislature will make in 2023. So we count upon this legislation in 2023 uh, to be passed. And then the investment account system number three will substitute this system number two. And actually, it will combine the um, tax withholdings and it will become more attractive uh, as a more convenient tool based on our estimates. In the best of cases, such mechanisms will come into effect as of 2024. I mean, investment uh, accounts um, yeah, number two and number three, uh, one will be able to open in 2023, but in any case, until the point, and not until the point in time, once the ultimate decision is made, because once the system 3.0 is uh, passed, then uh, you won't be able to open the older kinds of accounts. And I mean, the older kinds of accounts will continue being effective if an individual a holder won't decide to open the version number three. So once the number three version is uh, open, Open, then the older ones will cease to be effective. So you won't be able to open up the new investment account. Uh, but that, as of uh, the law, uh, when it comes to in effect, because until then, the legislation will continue working on it. And so the uh, version one and version two will continue operating. And the second question was about the advice. Well, the first thing that I feel like saying, of course, 
independent investment decisions based on one's own discretion in the securities market require knowledge and experience. And so we believe that for a startup investor, I, th I think the, a qualified investor has such knowledge and a qualified investor will be able to decide on what's more suitable. We're speaking rather about the novices. And so the best thing to do would be to um, resort to the professional help. And these are mutual funds and the fiduciary um, uh, brokers. You can also ask uh, for an investment advice, which may offer you a strategy depending upon the future investor's profile, propensity towards risk taking. But an investor should always be aware that investing into uh, securities are always wrought with risks. The risks may be different depending upon a specific tool chosen. And uh, as a rule, the higher is the yield, the greater is the risk. And something that I would like to draw investors' attention to, the important thing is that an investor is an individual who has already created a certain safety cushion in the form of risk-free investments. It means that an individual must have a certain fund which, in case losses are incurred, will cover the minimum spending requirements like paying for the utility bills and something else. If there is no cushion like that, before going into the investment market, you must create such a savings cushion in order to feel confident, including in the uh, securities market investments. Yes, Michael, please. Good afternoon, Elvira Sahibzadovna, Alexei Borisovich uh, Mikhail Kuznetsov is my name from Vedemosti. One of those days, Vedemosti found out that the Ministry of Finance is planning to combine the voluntary and the mandatory medical insurance and is currently conducting a debate with the market. Can you share the position of the central bank about it and whether the central bank is involved in this discussion? Well, this kind of a discussion, of course, requires a serious weighting of all pros and contras. I'm sure there are certain pros, of course, but uh, in my mind, the market or the voluntary medical insurance is actively evolving and we will definitely participate in such a discussion. It's a very serious discussion. It's just so that it is currently going through its initial stages. The next question comes from online. Anastasia Stogny from Financial Times. We can't hear you. Uh, colleagues, uh, Alex, yes, please. Good afternoon, Alexander Bar of Reuters. First of all, I would like to ask you what kind of decisions you had on the table today. Um, uh, uh, for example, have you been considering a lower key rate? Uh, also, the uh, central bank doesn't expect the economic decline next year, and this is the expectation in between 1 to 4 percent. But is there a risk that this particular forecast is going to be even worse because of the demobilization? impact upon the reduction of the available labor force. My next question is about the Odkrita Bank. Could you share with us uh, the uh, price involved in that deal? Well, as far as the first question is concerned, we had a broad consensus today with respect to keeping the rate as is. Our discussions were around um, a certain signal, but also there was an idea approached about uh, toughening that signal further. As far as the GDP is concerned, Alexei Borisovich, please, could you please repeat your question because I couldn't make out what you uh, had in mind. I mean that the GDP is going to be even lower, uh, worse than the forecast that we had in October. I mean the decline is going to be stronger because of the mobilization. I mean, the October forecast is minus 3.3 uh, for 2022 GDP, and uh, the expected decline was something that uh, we 
put together 30 days after the announcement of the partial mobilization, and so we believe that the first round of uh, its uh, impacts have been adequately reflected in this forecast, but further on we will further specify uh, it as the data appears. But as you know, in our macroeconomic survey, as well as the comments in the media and the general expectation, it looks like the figures of 2022 are going to be slightly better than minus 3.5. Uh, so the forecast for 2023, again, is going to be further updated in February, but I can tell you right here and now that in some cases it is also possible that a much higher base of 2022 will reduce the result of 2023 compared to 2022. It is quite possible. In the meantime, we've got a broad range uh, for 2023, which is minus 1 to minus 4. With respect to the Credit Bank uh, deal price, we will announce it once uh, all of the negotiations are finalized, and that will happen before the end of this year. Thank you very much. The next question uh, online, Victoria Shergina, Law and Finance. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask a question. Some of the Russian brokers' clients uh, have the Swiss francs uh, frozen on the brokerage accounts. People cannot dispose of them. They cannot sell them. They cannot put them into a bank account. Are you familiar with their situation? And what are the reasons behind it? And when do you believe one can expect this problem to be resolved? Thank you. Yes, I am familiar with this problem. The Moscow Exchange, uh, indeed, uh, has stopped trading in Swiss franc, the reason being that there have been certain difficulties in settlement because of the restrictions imposed by the Swiss side. And the Moscow Exchange uh, currently is working with its correspondent banks in order to um, uh, finish uh, settlement processes uh, which are being done in the Swiss francs. Uh, Sergei Bolotov. Sergei Bolotov, URA. Are you? I have several different questions. And the first one, where do you believe the probability has shifted between the three scenarios that the Bank of Russia is considering the base one, the uh, accelerated adaptation, and the global crisis? My second question, does the central bank currently have a short list of uh, basic uh, uh, contestant uh, for the digital financial asset operator status? And the decision about the extent, the subsidized mortgage, uh, first the budget was adopted, and the minister of Finance said that it is not putting in any spending for the mortgage, uh, uh, subsidized mortgage. Then it came out with a different statement, and the, the respective uh, fiscal spending will be put into it. What kind of impact it might create upon inflation and the subsequent key rate decisions? As far as the probability of shifting in between different scenarios is concerned, I believe that in November we said that in our mind, a certain probability of the global crisis scenario has increased, that the scenario has shifted itself towards that, and so our assessment stays at that level and no additional uh, shifting occurred. As far as the digital asset uh, operators are concerned, several applications have been registered. Um, I don't have this information currently available uh, close at my hand. Uh, to share with you. As far as further extending the subsidized mortgaging and its impact upon inflation in our decisions, by themselves, additional spending within the subsidized mortgage would hardly be able to produce any serious impact upon our decisions on the key rate and the inflation. Um, the size of it uh, is relatively uh, small, I mean, relative to all the rest of the uh, fiscal indicators. But we are going to make up our mind taking into account the amount of subsidized programs, not only in the mortgage sector, because clearly whenever there are subsidized programs, apart from the market-based lending, the subsidized lending does influence the aggregate demand. And so the bigger such programs are in size, the bigger 
is the size of such subsidies. With all else being equal, the market rate must be higher, and consequently that may lead to a higher key rate. Yes, Mr. Zabotkin? Uh, I also wanted to explain in terms of the basic mechanisms of how the subsidized lending and mortgage and the rest of the programs impact the aggregate demand and inflation is not in the fiscal system spending additional funds in the form of subsidies, but in there an additional amount of lending being created. Such subsidized programs start acting as autonomous factor in easing the lending terms. And this is the effect which we have to compensate for through a slightly higher rate so that the higher rate should be offered to a market-based lending activities. Uh, Maria Pimino from NTV, please. Mariana Pimito, Business News. My first question is, was mentioned more than once that pro-inflation risks have grown. Could you identify any specific uh, product or the sectors where the risks are particularly stronger? And my second question, that the Christmas uh, holidays are coming and some of the Russians definitely are going to travel abroad. The situation with the Mir cards is difficult. A hard currency will be sought after. Doesn't central banks see a risk of shortages uh, uh, amongst the Russians to buy hard currency in order to travel abroad? As far as pro-inflationary risks are concerned, we define the factors which uh, affect the overall price dynamics without specifying uh, individual prices, because that depends upon individual preferences, upon the uh, um, specific uh, consumption basket, upon uh, the demand uh, emerging in a specific uh, market, like I previously said, the uh, grains and vegetables. Um, there are various seasonal factors and uh, other things which are at play there. Uh, but as far as being able to pay traveling abroad is concerned, indeed, some of the countries continue to process uh, the mere cards um, through the local banks. Some do not. Uh, we are working with these countries in order to consider alternative uh, payment methods. But because of that, we do not see any spike of demand for cash uh, in order to end up being in a shortage. Apart from it, we allow the banks, you know, to sell uh, currency cash, which they uh, collect in their um, uh, cash uh, desks. Another attempt by Anastasia Stagny from the Financial Times. Good afternoon once again. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask a question. I wanted to um, ask about the central bank's uh, purchasing of gold. I understand that uh, such information information cannot be disclosed in detail right now, but possibly could you give us an inclination about uh, how much the central bank was buying last year? Because before the pandemic, the central bank was a major buy, and you know, could you compare what it is now compared to the pandemic level? I can only respond by saying that we do not disclose our level of activity with uh, the acquisition of gold. Fyodor, please. Fyodor Ivanov, Invest Future. My first question is about the ruble exchange rate. Uh, it would be great to find out uh, how stable the central bank currently see the devaluation of ruble as opposed to US dollar and RMB. And my second question is about the discussion around the so-called um, information disclosure closed platform for professional players, uh, wherein a uh, management company is going to be allowed a witch credit it's a disbalance in the market uh, with regard to the distribution of data, and many are looking at it as the legalization of an insider trading. Could you comment on it somehow and explain what the central bank uh, thinks about it? Maybe certain restrictions are going to be imposed upon those who are going to receive this information or data. I am for an equitable access to publicly disclosed information, and we come out for this information to be subject of disclosure post July 1st, with the exception of a short list of sensitive information, so that everyone can gain access to it. And uh, I would ask Mr. Zabotkin to respond to the first question. Well, I would like to say that in terms of what is currently going on, these is the uh, reverberations of uh, the rural exchange because of the changes in the external environment to the extent that I can see the ruble is notably uh, stronger than it was last year in the beginning of uh, 
this year. So rubble is going to reflect the way um, changes are going to take place in terms of the physical size of the Russian exports as well as our ability to import. Uh, currently, the trading balance remains in a significant position. Well, I suppose the last question comes from Ivan. Uh, Ivan Schligen, for MAG, are you? Uh, good afternoon. Two quick questions. Uh, first one is about the creation of reserves. To what extent within the current environment it is possible to establish them? Uh, and is there any task to follow through that? And if so, what for? Because the conditions have changed. And my second question is about the partial mobilization. Have all the tasks been fulfilled so far, and have you had to directly deal with the Ministry of Defense before that, or you didn't have to? While I uh, fail to uh, fully understand your question, could you please explain? Uh, please. Well, my second question was simply about whether you had to uh, sort out any details uh, in a direct discussion with the representative of the Ministry of Defense in order to somehow solve certain issue um, uh, related to the partial mobilization. Well, I suppose uh, I can't remember any issues like that. But maybe this is about uh, the grace period for the loans to the mobilized ones. Yes, yeah, that's exactly what I was after. Well, within our competency, we do maintain discussions with the Ministry of Defense, but um, nothing other than that I can recall uh, about um, hard currency and gold, uh, precious metals reserves. Our currency and precious metals reserves are sufficient right now. We don't run a special task to accumulate hard currency and precious metals reserves when we made up our mind to keep two parts of them, one for the currency financial crisis, the other part for any uh, um, negative geopolitical scenario unfolding as a result of it. We are currently having a sufficient uh, amount of resources, both in RMB and in gold and there is no need to collect it further. Um, uh, buying uh, currency and precious metals reserves uh, will happen only if uh, uh, we need to accumulate those as part of the fiscal rule process. I mean, the fiscal rule, which, uh, for example, comes into effect, and once its specific parameters uh, are identified, then we would act uh, as an agent of the Minister of Finance and we'll start collecting it further. Uh, their behest. Oh, sorry, there is another question. The last question, which comes from Vladivostok. Andrei Pushkarev from Vladivostok newspaper. Could you please explain the situation where the lending? The central bank is not raising the key rate. However, the commercial banks during the past two months have dramatically raised their rates, practically covering all kinds of lending, including mortgage. Is it their response to risks, or the credit and financial institutions are playing according to their own rules, which do not uh, align with the key rate? Well, well, thank you. That is a very important and very proper question in order to understand the way the you know, monetary policy works and the extent to which the current level of rates uh, in terms of the deposit and lending are affected by our key rate because our key instrument is our key rate. And so the first thing that I would like to uh, say is that the lending rates in that uh, was uh, what the question was about. Apart from the key rate, there, there are other factors. I mean, the key rate is a significant factor, but there are other factors which define the level of the key rate, because the key rate um, is the landmark for the short lending. It's uh, interbanking uh, loans for one day. And so these rates, they keep close to the key rate. They're not really running too far away from it. And so in this sense, we're in a position to fully control the cost of short money. As far as the lending rates are concerned, that is where the risks are being taken into account that lenders take on the term of uh, the lending, the level of uh, the ability to pay uh, by borrowers, the inflation. All of these are being taken into account in such long-term rates. And we do see that when rates are growing, 
without us raising the key rate. There could be reasons for that. Uh, for example, recently we've been noticing that uh, the lending rates have changed under the influence of uh, the risk premium, and that is uh, something that we've uh, registered. And so the, fisc uh, the monetary policy continues to work. And when we were making our decision about the monetary policy and the level of the key rate, we take into account the lending rates dynamics and whether the risk premiums have grown or not. And in relationship to that, uh, we um, retune our monetary policy. Uh, Mr. Zabotkin, please. The only thing that I may add, if you take a look at the um, press releases and uh, the board of directors statement, some of the previous ones, including today's one, you will notice that the board of directors of the central bank systemically notes the factor of an impact uh, coming from the higher premiums for the uh, credit risk and uh, their impact upon uh, the uh, monetary terms as a disinflationary factor. And as Mrs. Nabiulina has already noted, it is being taken into account when the central bank identifies the key rate to a certain extent, one may say that this is one of the factors as to why uh, the current key rate is 7.5, which is lower than it was in the beginning of the year, because indeed uh, this expansion of the uh, lending spreads, uh, it works uh, towards the uh, monetary terms becoming tougher, and we partially compensate for that by reducing our key, key rate. Yes, and one may say that every time we are assessing the level of toughness of the monetary conditions, not within our key rate, but in terms of what plays out in the broader economy and what are the rates that the borrowers are offered by the banks. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Thank you so much. And sorry we were not able to answer all your questions. Thank you.